So, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Rahel Zivner. I'm project manager for Spain, Italy and Portugal at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation in Madrid. Now, take a cup of coffee or tea, make yourself comfortable and enjoy listening to our second edition of our podcast, Meloni's Gambit, where we give you an insight into the political evolution in Italy. And I'm very happy that this episode is being made possible thanks to the collaboration with our partner Think Tank from Italy, the Bruno Leone Institute. My guests today are again Professor Alberto Mingardi, Professor of History of Political Thought and Director General of the Bruno Leone Institute, and Carlos Stagnaro, Head of Research at the Instituto Bruno Leone. In our last episode, we introduced our listeners into the matter of Italy's new budget law and what to expect from the economic policy of the most right-wing government democratic Italy has seen so far. Where we were kind of moderately um, satisfied with the outcome so far of economic policies. Um, but nevertheless... Um, there is an ongoing political polarization in Italy, and obviously that is a concern we should really take a deeper look into today. So let's start with my first question. Um, having arrived in the reality of governing, uh, we know that Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni so far has acted quite smart. She has a lot of support from, uh, from the population. And she's very aware of Italy's economic constraints. Um, she therefore has thought to fill in key ministries with high profile experts and is in some ways continuing the policies which uh, already the Draghi cabinet had started. Um, so I assume she is rather unlikely to lose her consensus anytime soon. But anyways, there remains this far right wing threat um, and Meloni has succeeded in transforming an extremist right wing party into a governing party that attracts voters nationwide. So could this also be a model for other far right wing parties? And what does this mean for the political mood in the country and the role that Italy might play in the EU after the 2024 EU elections? Well, thank you very much Ryan, for this question. I don't know uh, to what extent uh, Meloni can be a model for different countries. Uh, one thing that should be remembered is that Italy is a consistently right of center country. Uh, basically, um, the Italian voters have always voted for center right parties, uh, beginning with uh, 1948. With only one exception, 2000, oh, I'm sorry, 1996, uh, when the left of center coalition won election, the base right was split. Uh, the second time that Romano Prodi won election, uh, that was um, 2006, he won election by something like 30,000 votes in a country of 60 million, so a very teeny tiny uh, majority. So. Uh, consistently over time, the majority of Italians, for different reasons, perhaps for opposing reasons in the north and in the south, are, as we call them in Italy, moderates. So the genius of uh, Giorgio Meloni was basically turning in the last election a small party, the Brothers of Italy, a party that was established uh, basically as a reaction against the Mario Monti uh, government and that kept consistently in the opposition uh, basically uh, for a decade, turning that party into something like, you know, a new version of the Christian Democrats, a party of the nation, uh, which has a uh, gain vote in, in substantial proportions uh, also in the north, which is not, you know, the most uh, hospitable place historically for for uh, that kind of, of right of center policy and that traditionally, at least in the last 
uh, 30 years, uh, was keener to vote either for Berlusconi or for Mastiosa. So, in a sense, Meloni obtained this tremendous consensus because she was the new thing, but following the footstep of a very traditional approach in Italian politics. So, she was in the right, she was the new game in town in the right in a country, which is very likely to vote for the moderate option. Uh, how long is she going to be uh, lasting? Well, this will depend on a variety of factors, which is a pretty obvious answer. Uh, the average length of an Italian government is pretty short, is 14 months. Uh, but Meloni is actually likely to last longer uh, for two reasons. The first one is that she's an extremely smart and capable politician, as she's proving these days. And she's clearly, so far at least, uh, capable of winning consensus from her friends. So consolidating her own party in the right at the expense of the Northern League and of Forza Italia. Uh, but also the other reason why she's likely uh, to last in power is that, um, you know, there is polarization in Italy as in many countries. And the left is becoming uh, way, way more extreme than it used to be in the past. So in many ways, the fact that the uh, left of center parties, the Democratic Party and the Five Star Movement, are uh, walking down the road of political extremism is consolidating Meloni as a point of reference for moderates. I see. Um, you're mentioning that uh, Meloni is very likely to hold on to power uh, for quite a while. Um, and you were mentioning Meloni's alliance partners who play rather... Uh, let, let me just interject. That, that she, it, it should be normal that she stays in power for five years. I mean, that, that should be the thing. Uh, the problem, the pathology, is an old pathology of Italian democracy that for a variety of reasons and, and basically for because of Italian political culture on the one end and on a semi-proportional representation system on the other end, uh, we had this historical tendency of very short-lived governments. But, you know, she won election uh, and she should stay there for five years and then the voters will decide. That's how, in theory, uh, it, it should be, but in Italy it's rather uh, less uh, the reality that that happens, right? I think in 76 years, this is the 68th uh, government uh, Italy is, is, is having. Um, but, so let's assume Meloni is likely to hold on to power. Um, you were mentioning her alliance partners who kind of hold the junior part in this alliance. Um, so to what extent do you think is this coalition to stay in power? And um, could it be that, for example, the liberal list, the third poll, um, could become a possible future coalition partner for Maloney if the coalition breaks down in a, in a cabinet Maloney too, so to say? And... Um, what would that mean for the liberal identity if they would if they would if they would enter into such a coalition with Fratelli d'Italia? Well, uh, we had a little bit of a back and forth with Carlo. The point there is that in her name. Italian uh, quote-unquote liberal lists uh, are basically established upon the idea of projecting or smuggling uh, some liberal principles within a wider coalition. And so far, um, because of the personal history of people like Calenda or Renzi, quite obviously, and of course, you know, even stronger sense, uh, Bonino, who's the only one who had been once at least 
uh, allied with Berlusconi and with the forerunner of Meloni's party, and who actually became a European commissioner, uh, thanks to uh, Silvio Berlusconi. So all these people considering themselves to um, belong to a big tent left, to be part of the extended center-left coalition. Uh, but of course, um, such a common ground with the left is possible only insofar as the bigger parties uh, on the left are interested in finding some common ground. And I don't think that they'll be. I think that the political game that uh, Michelin, as a leader of the Democratic Party, and uh, Mr. Conte, as the leader of the Five Star Movement, are playing, is clearly a profoundly um, different one. So they want to be uh, basically uh, waging the flags of um, extensive redistribution, uh, economic intervention, and, and all of that. And uh, I think it would be very difficult even for a person like Mr. Kalenda, who likes to uh, portray himself as a man of the left, it would be quite difficult for him to uh, basically find a common language with the new democratic party in the Five Star. Of course, there is an opening, theoretically speaking, on the right, so to say, so uh, changing uh, position and, and trying instead to smuggle some more liberal ideas, to say, on the right. Um, but how open is that window will ultimately depend on Mr. Berlusconi. Forza Italia is, in many ways, the more centrist, more liberal democrat um, uh, length of the center-right coalition now. So if Berlusconi's party uh, fades away, as it is a possibility, because Mr. Berlusconi is no longer a baby and uh, somehow his age is also having an effect on his uh, electoral performance, is no longer perceived as credible as the new thing, uh, well, understandably so, by Italian voters. So if Forza Italia fades away, uh, then I think it is possible to forecast, you know, a, a reshuffling of the center-right coalition in which the Northern League um, returns to be a, a largely Northern party. Uh, uh, Fratelli Italia, the Brothers of Italy, is the bulk of the coalition, is the pivot of the other party. And, uh, you know, there is clearly room for a more centrist uh, option. Of course, it, in many ways, it is difficult to make a national forecast based upon regional elections, but the last regional elections at least showed that Berlusconi's Forza Italia is more resilient uh, than what most of us believed, which is, again, totally understandable because lots of people vote as a habit. They go back to the ballot and they vote for the same electoral symbols they crossed before. Um, so that, that I think it's a possibility that it will require uh, a change in, in the rhetoric of this smaller uh, centrist uh, uh, liberal uh, parties, um, but it will also depend upon the uh, resilience of Berlusconi's Forza Italia. The stronger Berlusconi keeps uh, the less likely it is for Calenda and Renzi to find home with the center right. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, Carlo, do you want to yes, add anything on the development of the political landscape? Yes, let me add to... one thing. Um, in in the Italian history, both recent and less recent, uh, you quite often have uh, small groups of people, small parties, or individual MPs moving left to right or vice versa in joining a majority. But that usually happens when the majority is very weak or when the, the, the majority margin is tiny. 
and therefore uh, the prime minister needs some parliamentary support in order to uh, be uh, confident enough um, that the government will will not go uh, uh, will not lose uh, parliamentary votes. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the situation is quite different. Uh, the parliamentary majority of the government is large enough. Uh, it it's between fifty five and sixty percent of the votes, uh, both in the chamber and in, in and in the senate. So Meloni does not really need, at least in terms of parliamentary equilibria. Uh, more MPs, or or uh, she she has no particular need to increase or to enlarge uh, the size of her majority. Um, she may need uh, to have uh, uh, a counterpart as a sort of edge uh, against potential uh, uh, conflicts within her own majority, that, that is with Berlusconi or with Salvini. But even that, I think. Uh, is quite unlikely at the time being. There may be disagreements between Salvini and Berlusconi on, on the one hand and Meloni on the other hand, but it is very, very unlikely that either Salvini or Berlusconi or both uh, take the responsibility of endangering uh, the survival of the government, especially uh, given what Alberto has just said. That is that, that both the Democratic Party and the Five Stars movement uh, have moved so much on the left uh, that there is, uh, at least for now, uh, uh, a very large majority in the public opinion, in the Italian society, that either believes that this government should stay in power or that uh, are convinced that an alternative government led by the left would be worse. Uh, so I think that, that there, for, for, for once, Italy may be one of the most stable countries in Europe, at least for some time. That would be quite some news, uh, I assume. Um, and I totally agree uh, with you. Um, there are a lot of red lines um, to mingle uh, with the majority. So let's see um, if our liberal friends um, and find their right their right track. And obviously, the shift to the left of the PD by the election of uh, Eli Schlein um, does does have some consequences um, for the for the um, Partito Democratico and and the margin of their voters. Um, so now i want to i want to dive a little deeper into the question of civil rights slash human rights um because miloni as the leader of fratelli d'italia um as we know has moderated her tone strongly after steering for more than 10 years far right wing slogans um, so still, the question remains, what does she actually stand for on the long term, even though right now um, she seems to have moderated her tone and maybe this is not a radical change, but but is there the danger of this being a slow cultural one? Um, I was very um, upset or I, it caught my attention when I heard that some ministries were renamed, um, which explicitly reflect a reactionary identity and protectionism. Um, I heard, for example, that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food uh, Sovereignty um, is in place now, or the Ministry of Enterprise and Made in Italy uh, or the Ministry of Family and Birth. And also when we look at the um, Minister of Family, uh, Eugenia Rocella, I think uh, is her name. She has been quite an advocate for very trad traditionalist uh, position, positions. And I mean, Molinoi herself, yes, she is the first woman in this office as Prime Minister, um, but is she hiding a ultra conservative backward agenda um, behind, and is there really a real threat of the curtailment of civil rights and liberties? Um, for example, when we talk about her promotion of the traditional family 
um, or um, same-sex marriage or uh, chap stepchild adoption and so on. And obviously what also comes to my mind is uh, Meloni has her electorate. So uh, what is she what is she going to serve them? Um, I don't know who of you. I think there is no, there is absolutely no danger for so-called civil rights in Italy. Um, I find uh, all of this discussion uh, actually quite hypocritical. Um, you know, we may agree or disagree with same-sex marriage or with uh, youth solely for migrants, uh, but it is a fact that when the left had the possibility to introduce them, it didn't. So I don't understand why they are now asking a right-wing government to do something progressive, quote-unquote, that the progressive didn't do when they were in government. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the state of the law and the state of, uh, you know, uh, legal recognition of uh, this kind of personal rights, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a safe forecast uh, that Italy will not become the most, uh, quote-unquote, a progressive state uh, in the West or in the foreseeable future, uh, but there is no serious talk of revising any of the existing discipline, uh, including, uh, more importantly than anything else, uh, in matters concerning abortion. Uh, when it comes to abortion, Meloni is clearly to the left of uh, virtually all the uh, Western world uh, right-wing parties. She doesn't want to change the law. And the same is true for uh, Ms. Rocella, who used to be many years ago, uh, a, a party member of the radical party in Italy, then she changed uh, her mind. But, you know, what she said a number of times is something which I think is simply true, which is abortion is a is a terrible choice in many sense, but it is a choice nonetheless. So the thing she emphasized at the time is that women should have uh, the possibility to have a legal abortion, but she uh, basically underlined that, you know, uh, going for an abortion is not uh, picking a different kind of ice cream for lunch. And that is clearly the case. So I don't think there is any danger for existing um, quote-unquote civil rights uh, uh, in Italy, certainly we should not expect uh, the Meloni government uh, to behave like the Schlein government, uh, but when it comes to politics, I, I do not even understand this. I mean, the, the very existence of a Schlein option is for the voters to be picked. And uh, if uh, Meloni was doing the sort of thing Schlein uh, who would like the government to do, we will be living in a single party system, which I hope is not something any of us want. Well, that's very soothing to hear that <laughs> you don't see uh, the danger of uh, the further uh, curtailing um, of civil rights. But Carlos, uh, Carlo wants to add. Yeah, yes, I'm slightly more pessimistic than Albert on this. Uh, at least on 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 two areas, uh, one is uh, surrogate motherhood is illegal in Italy, but what happens is that uh, people may go uh, in places where uh, this is allowed, then they uh, come back and the and the partner within a same sex marriage uh, files uh, the pro the procedure for an adoption of the baby. Um, uh, which is a very uh, complex and in, in, in indirect uh, uh, way of of allowing this, but but it is how it goes, or at least it is how it has gone so far. I think that on this there may be um, some some steps backwards, at least uh, if we take seriously what what some ministers and 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 influential MPs have said in in the past few days. And the other, the other issue where I think uh, we should closely monitor what happens is immigration. 
um, the government has taken a very tough stance rhetorically uh, on on immigration. Um, they have tried to uh, make it harder for 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 boats for for immigrant ships uh, to uh, to enter an Italian port by, for example, uh, giving them as a destination a very uh, distant port rather than the, the, the closest one. Um, at the same time, I think there is an understand a broad understanding uh, uh, that we need uh, some some immigration because we do not have uh, workers enough. Uh, uh, the demography is very depressing, and so on and so forth. So there may be a tension between uh, the need uh, of at least some people within the majority to 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 show the muscle to to uh, uh, show that they are sticking to the electoral promise of closing our borders and the the uh, concrete need uh, to keep uh, people entering uh, Italy and entering the, the the job market in particular. From this point of view, I think that you mentioned the renaming of some ministries, including the Ministry uh, for Family and, and Birth. Uh, I think there is also a, a sort of contradiction between some uh, reactionary or, or hyper-conservatives, hyper-conservative uh, positions and uh, the aim of inverting the trend towards uh, demographic reduction. Uh, given the situation so far in Italy, uh, if you really think uh, you should put in place policies to uh, increase uh, the residential, the resident population in Italy, you should uh, increase immigration and and perhaps also make it easier for for non traditional families to to uh, uh, be formed and to uh, uh, create new babies. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, from a very conservative point of view, uh, as the one uh, expressed by Minister Rochelle and others, this is sort of uh, uh, anathema. Um, so the government will, will will come to a point where they will have to choose between uh, sticking to uh, the rhetorical uh, conservative positions, socially conservative position that many of them have, and the uh, uh, actual uh, belief that we should find ways to 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 increase population uh, the population in Italy. Um, we shall see. Uh, I I tend to agree with Alberto that I don't expect big steps uh, backwards. Uh, of course, I don't expect any uh, step forward in terms of civil liberties. Um, I think there are some areas where where. Uh, something good or bad may happen. Thank you so much, Carlo, for touching upon the migration topic. That would have been actually my my next question. And uh, as you say, Italy's population is uh, highly aging. I think it's among the oldest uh, in Europe. And obviously, this question of legal immigration ways of skilled workforce fo will become an issue. Uh, also for Italy, and uh, maybe that could be a topic for for another edition of our podcast. Um, and obviously, uh, Meloni has announced uh, her attention to stop migration, um, especially across the Mediterranean. Um, and the issue of migration is highly emotional, and rescue at sea is also very complex. Um, but could you just um, add... Uh, your thoughts on is there looming or, or is a new dispute on the distribution and migration policy on the European level? Is there a new dispute dispute looming or will we just continue um, with the different views as, we, as we've already had in the past where no no real solution could have been found so far among the EU members on the distribution of of uh, the migration burden. Well, th th that's a very big question. Um, of course, it may it, it is not really a question which depends on on whatever Italy would do. It mostly uh, depends on on uh, the other uh, member states. Um, 
I think that the closer we get to uh, national or European elections, the harder it will be uh, to find an agreement. At the same time, uh, the practical experience of the past few years uh, shows that somehow, whenever a big flow of migrants is in place, uh, Europe finds a ways to, to, to manage it. It happened uh, with the Syrian refugees uh, a few years ago. It, it, it is happening with the massive migration from Ukraine uh, now. And, and oh, it, it, it will keep happening. My feeling is that this issue of redistributing the, the migrants in the European soil is much more, a, a, let's say, a political flag to wave uh, before the electorate than an actual issue. By the way, uh, a few years ago, uh, I think it was uh, 2016 or 17, uh, there was a major, well, not a major crisis, but a, but a big flow uh, of migrants from North Africa to Italy. And, and, and of course, we had some, some issues managing them. And then uh, Interior Minister uh, said in a statement, in a public statement, that uh, yes, we do have all of these people getting on our coast, but please, Italians, do not be 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 warned, uh, because uh, most of them do not actually want to stay in Italy. They, they they just arrive here because we are the closest the closest place to where they live, uh, but most of them are actually uh, willing to go north. Uh, we, we, which is not a, a good thing for Italy because it means that Italy is not perceived as an attractive country even by people uh, uh, fleeing away from, from, from wars and hunger. Uh, but it also tells that the, the mm, management of migrant crisis is already a de facto uh, European issue, whatever formal agreements say. Yes, I also think that migration is used very often as flag not to deal with problems as such. And it is, it is true that particularly these days, there are areas in Italy which have a severe safety and security problem. But this is a matter of um, basically keeping the rule of law in place. It's not a matter that you solve by, uh, you know, um, limiting uh, migration in the roughest way. I think if we want to do something uh, for easing, you know, the impact of migration, the single most important thing will be liberalizing the labor market, because clearly it will be much easier for will make much easier for migrants to find a legitimate workplace and integrate themselves in the Italian economy and society. The paradox is that we do have people that advocate one thing, but not the other. Want more migrants, but they don't want a liberalized labor market. They want a more liberalized labor market, but they don't want uh, more migrants. But that's the way to go. And, and, and you know, if, if the country is growing, uh, which is Italy's single most important problem. I mean, how to go back to have a sustainable level of growth if the country is growing, the problem of migration it is easing itself. Thank you very much, Alberto, for bringing that up. I think that is an, a very important point. Um, you mentioned um, that there is the need of liberalizing the labor market. Yes, exactly. Um, but... Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, that could be also <laughs> another topic uh, for for another episode. Um, I think our time is almost up, so I just want to close our discussion with my one last question um, regarding uh, young people who are of uh, high importance for, for our future and uh, the prospects of young people uh, in Italy have not been so good in the past. There have been high levels of youth unemployment um, and the state uh, tends to offer very few opportunities, at least to some um, parts of the young population. So I was wondering, how do you view the situation for young people right now in Italy? And 
the correlation of economic insecurity with political radicalization or the openness to populist uh, positions. Well, I, I, I leave to Alberto the discussion of the political aspects of this. Uh, let me uh, stress one point. Uh, as you said, the situation of the young people in Italy is not very, very good, as you can see from the high levels of youth unemployment, especially in the South, and by the high levels of migration of young Italians, especially uh, those with, with uh, 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 great, uh, greater human capital uh, moving abroad. Uh, there has been uh, there have been over the years several attempts to to develop a, a policy for the young, and I think that most of this is uh, basically a waste of resource uh, at best. Uh, if you want to keep uh, young people in the country, and perhaps if you want to attract young people from other countries, including uh, uh, educated young people from other countries, you have to. Uh, uh, kick your economy in a way that it becomes more dynamic and more attractive and eventually uh, that, that grows more, like Alberto, as Alberto said. And if you want to do this, you do not have to do anything specific for the young. Uh, you have to uh, remove the obstacles to growth, which are high taxes, high regulation, uh, uh, um, inefficient public sector, in a few, uh, uh, long um, times, the, 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 I mean, uh, excessive time for resolving disputes uh, and, and the like. I think that at least on some of these issues, uh, the government uh, uh, um, is trying uh, to, to do something. Uh, as we record this conversation, the government has just uh, proposed a, a, a draft uh, fiscal reform. It, it is at, at its very early stages, so we don't know precisely where it will go, but we, we do have some ideas uh, with the basic idea uh, of, of uh, reducing taxes and of making uh, the entire tax system uh, simpler. Uh, we will see if this actually happens. Uh, on other topics, uh, they have not been doing anything particular uh, so far. Uh, for example, as far as the, the public sector reform, or even labor market reform uh, are concerned. But if, if the government is seriously want to do something to keep the young Italians here and to attract educated young from, from other countries, uh, both in Europe and elsewhere, it just have to, to do what, what is good for the economy, that is to, to listen to uh, um, free marketing tanks <laughs> and, 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 and uh, uh, to other advocates uh, of reforms that may uh, um, spur uh, competition, could create uh, more competition in the country and that may, can make uh, uh, the Italian economy more dynamic and that can ultimately uh, improve the productivity of, the, of our economy. I agree with Carlo that uh, the interest of the youth in a way which is similar um, with the interest of consumers, it is actually the closest approximation we do have of the common good. So it's, it's, it's the interest of you know, the country writ large uh, in the future. Of course, the problem is that um, young people uh, tend, uh, particularly these days, not to be particularly interested in politics, not to be particularly active in politics, and sometimes not to be particularly smart in identifying their own interests. Uh, I participated with Rael last year in a very interesting meeting at New York University in Milan. Uh, that was about how, you know, the young generation is reacting to the two crises that we experience up to then. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you go and, and poll the youngster, actually, you, you have interest uh, answers when it comes to philosophy or broader political view, but sometimes the details are missing. And I find particularly discouraging what is happening in France, 
uh, these days when we are recording this uh, podcast, uh, which is basically you know, this widespread opposition to a pension reform, that clearly you know, is creating some losers in society and they are certainly at liberty to react to that. But it's a reform ultimately in to the benefit of younger people. And there's no sign of younger people showing that they understand it. They understand that this reform is actually making, uh, you know, their financial position more sustainable. Uh, and, uh, and it's very likely to help in fostering more economic growth and uh, allowing for some more uh, employment. Uh, so I think it's a great challenge for, for all of us, for institutions like the uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation, for Mr. Leone. It, it, it's a great challenge for us to talk uh, with young people on two different levels. One is, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, transferring to them the, the great principle, the great ideas upon which our institutes are established and that our institutes preach. But the other big challenge is to uh, suggest them um, that there is, um, there are reasons to get involved in politics, particularly when their own interests are at stake. And, uh, you know, when it comes to issues that should be of, you know, great interest to young people like the public debt, or, or the pension system uh, that are things that will impact upon the future of people that are now 20s. Or, you know, as Carlo hinted at, um, the labor market deregulation and, and, and really deregulation more broadly. Uh, one would expect that young people are a voice, that they are lobbying for their own interest. Alas, uh, they're not. And this is a big problem. We should try to uh, work with somehow. Yes, so we shall keep on being dedicated to work on these challenges and to give young people a voice, definitely. Um, I think that was a very nice uh, last uh, intervention uh, for today. Uh, I would like to thank you both, uh, Alberto, Carlo. It was my pleasure. It was our thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking your time, for sharing your expertise and to give us a first-hand insight into Italian politics. Um, and of course, I would like to thank our listener, uh, to our audience for tuning in today. Make sure to stay tuned for our next episode of Meloni's Gambit, the podcast by Friedrich Naumann Foundation Madrid and the Bruno Leone Institute. Thank you.